Hey, it's Errol, and this is Vocal Defrag. Vocal defragging is an opportunity to give yourself a gift. A gift of you. Asking yourself the questions and then questioning the answers. Too often we rely on others to guide our way when in fact they weren't born with you. It's been your journey. You've had to walk in your own shoes. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't. And when they don't, we still don't ask the questions and then question the answers. I keep two different types of defrag journals. I have the one that I have with my handwriting, and then I do a vocal defrag. And the reason being is because as long as it's written on paper, when I come back to it to learn, it's an interpretation. But with vocal defragging, I can physically hear the emotions that are still growing inside my mind, body, and soul. So it's two different levels of learning more about yourself. Learning how to calm down the inner beast. Or better yet, maybe to ignite the creative self that you are, but just don't know how creative you are. This is Vocal Defrag. So we had an experience last night at the essential job, uh, two nights after the situation in the state of Maine. A gentleman walks into the store pretty much around maybe 9.15, and he's got a mask on that we're not used to seeing. You know, we live in these days, these COVID-19 days, where pretty much, you know, it looks like a medical mask. That's what most people are wearing. But this gentleman had on a different kind of mask that hid his entire face and part of his body below. That wasn't what got our anxiety up. It was the way that he was wearing his backpack. See, there's a reason why they call it a backpack. The back. But he was wearing a fully loaded backpack on the front part of his body. I've never seen that before. I could be crazy. Um, maybe, maybe it's just something that's going to become the future. Because if you've got a backpack on, you can't see who's coming up behind you. So if you've got valuables, I would put it in the front. I mean, that's what I do with my wallet. I don't put it in my back pocket. I keep it in my front pocket in fear of pickpockets. But his face fully covered, a backpack worn on the front. He enters the store and goes immediately into the bathroom for 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Nothing was moving. Our security was on high alert. Our security officer was nervous. He wanted to figure out what the situation was, since we were just two days off from what just took place in the state of Maine. When the gentleman came out of the bathroom, the backpack was now worn on his side, and he spent the next hour and a half inside our store. And as we tried to make some sort of conversation with him to get, you know, to get him engaged in something that said, hey, look, we know you're here. You know we're here. You got to feel that we're watching you, but we don't want you to feel nervous about the situation. Finally, at closing time, we kind of steered him in the direction of self-checkout. His cart, when I walked by him, was about three quarters full. But at closing time, there was nothing in the cart. Was it a theft? Was it a change of mind? I really don't need this stuff. But I don't want to go that route because there were baby diapers inside that cart when I had a conversation with him. Just engage, right? Isn't that what we're trained to do? Just go have a conversation. Okay, so here is the vocal defrag. We all have PTSD when it comes to these mass shootings. Learning how to deal with them, number one, seek a professional and talk it out. But when you can't get to a professional, you've got to be able to talk to yourself and ask questions. What could you have done differently that might have put the man in a position of, you know what, I don't need to be here. We don't know. We don't know. But if we don't start asking some questions about our own security and the way that we walk through a place of business with a mask on, with a backpack backwards, then what do we have here? We have silence. That means that we are accepting people for who and what they are, which is fine with me. But if you're going to live in nearly two hours of unbelievable stress, waiting for something to break out, that isn't fair to the common person. That isn't fair to even that guy, because maybe he felt uncomfortable knowing that we were watching him. So when you ask the questions and you question the answers, 
you've got to include the truth. The truth about last night was, yes, we did feel fear. No, we did not call the police. We had security, a loaded security officer. At no time did we feel like this man was going to bring harm, but yet his demeanor said, wait a second, was the man in Maine and all of these other mass shootings, were they easily identifiable? Or did they sneak in and everything broke apart? Asking yourself the questions, when somebody comes in, do not judge them. Do not put yourself in a position of fear, because unless you know, but then again, is that too late? Preparing your heart for what is about to attack you. The most dangerous thing, in all honesty, is that anxiety. How do you keep it under control? And make sure that it doesn't get out of control where accusations are thrown and reasons for being uncomfortable to another person grow. That's when stuff starts hitting the fan. We only wanted to have conversation with him just to be engaged. And it was always the casual, hey man, you finding everything okay? Dude, I like like what you got on today, man. I like that mask. I haven't seen that one. Where'd you find it at? But there was still that underlying anxiety, that fear that something was going to break down. And in the process of breaking down, were we smart enough to be prepared? Ask the questions. Question the answers. We do have PTSD. You might as well just say it to yourself in the mirror. We do. Because we fear a lot in this modern world. I'm Errol, and that's Vocal Defrag.